It is September 14th, 258 AD, and we see Cyprian, the bishop of Carthage and one of the greatest Latin theologians that the world would know. Only in this case, he is on trial. He is brought before the Roman council on orders by the emperor that all Christians should be examined and those found to be truly Christian should be executed. And Cyprian is brought by the proconsul Galerius, and he is asked his name, and Cyprian gives it. And then he is ordered to sacrifice to the Roman gods. Cyprian simply refused. And the proconsul conferred with his colleagues. And then he turned and said, Cyprian, you have lived an irreligious life, and you have drawn together a number of men bound by an unlawful association and you have professed yourself an open enemy to the gods and the religion of Rome, and at the end you shall be made an example of. And it was decided then and there that Cyprian would be put to death by the sword, and Cyprian's response was simply, Thanks be to God. It is hard to imagine how any of us would have responded under such great persecution and under such tyranny from the pagan Roman Empire. And in this lecture, we're going to look at the subject of what historians call the third century crisis. It's a crisis that occurred in the Roman Empire as the pagan world began to suffer certain cataclysmic events that were convulsing the empire and causing them to lose much of the identity that had been there since the formation of the empire under Caesar. And the third century crisis was so important, not only because it gave rise to several of the most important and vicious persecutions of Christians, but it's also important because it's the third century crisis and the conclusion of the third century crisis under Diocletian that paves the way for the coming of Constantine. And we're going to begin by looking at the issues that occurred in the Roman army that gave rise to failures amongst the armies as it attempted to defend its borders, as well as the Roman civil wars in which the army, feeling the weight of the fact that they were now suffering loss on the boundaries of their empire, but also the measures that the empire attempted to take in order to reestablish its dominance. And that attempt to reestablish its dominance really was an attempt to reassert the paganism of old Rome. First of all, just a look at the geography. Rome, of course, still covered vast swaths of Europe and the east. Its boundaries, of course, went from Britain all the way up in the north of Europe, all the way down to Spain, to North Africa, to the Roman area, the Mediterranean, and then all the way out east, all the way into what would eventually be Constantinople. And the problem of the 3rd century begins, first and foremost, with a military loss. All the way out east, there was now the Sassanid Empire. And the Sassanid Empire was a pretty significant force. They had cavalry, they had infantry that were equally matched with the Roman army at the time. And in fact, what happens is the Sassanid Empire believes that a lot of the areas that were now owned by Rome, the areas that Rome had taken over from Macedonia, from the Greek regions, the Sassanid Empire believed that those were their territories, and they wanted them back. And so they embarked on a process of attempting to wage war against the Roman Empire in the hopes of restoring these areas to themselves. And as it happens, the Romans met with stiff opposition. And the crisis begins in 235. The emperor Alexander Severus attempted to go out east and put a stop to the Sassanid Empire and its attempt to recapture these lands. And to the surprise of his armies and to Severus himself, the Roman Empire lost. And Severus had to retreat. And during the retreat, as a result of the loss and the embarrassment that Severus had brought upon Rome, he was assassinated by his own people. And the assassination of Severus brings with it 
the Roman civil wars. And the Roman civil wars are essentially a time in which the army attempted to reassert the dominance of the Roman Empire by constantly reasserting their own generals in the place of what was formerly the hereditary monarchy or the adopted monarchy of the Roman world. So just three years, for example, after the execution of Severus, we have what is known as the Year of Six Emperors. In 238, there were, throughout this year, a total of six individuals from the army who were proclaimed to be emperor. And each were assassinated, and then another one set up, and then an army would assassinate them, and then they would be setting up another emperor, etc. And for an empire that prided itself on stability and peace, and the dominance of its culture over those of the known world, this convulsion of the civil wars was really impactful. It often left the new emperor, whoever that might be at a given time, with the unenviable task of attempting to reassert the old paganism and the dominance of the Roman Empire, when in fact the power of the Roman Empire seemed to be slipping out of their hands at each given moment. And not only that, but when you have Roman armies fighting Roman armies, attempting to establish the dominance of their chosen successor over that of another, you get really nasty fighting. It, this is not the kind of fighting that you see, for example, when Rome is united and going after its enemies. Rome, of course, could be brutal then, but when you have Roman on Roman fighting, and you have armies believing on both sides that they hold the future of Rome in their hands, and that the fate of their nation, the fate of their empire, rested on whether or not they could slay their own peoples, their own citizens, and reassert their own dominance, then you get some really aggressive campaigning against one another. And on the borders, of course, the Roman Empire still had to deal with the threat of invasion from all kinds of oppositional forces. We've already mentioned the Sassanid Empire out east, and that empire continued to be a nuisance and a threat to the Roman way of life. Emperor after emperor attempt to go out and put a stop to the Sassanid Empire. Some fail, some are successful at great cost, and it's really not until the late 3rd century that they finally put it into the Sassanid Empire, and then only weekly. What happens actually out east is eventually there is a coup or a treasonous act by a man by the name of Odenathus. And Odenathus was a wealthy merchant, and seeing the Sassanid Empire on their borders out east and being concerned by this, he somehow managed to convince the legions to follow him, and they went out and put an end to at least a portion of the Sassanid Empire. And the problem here, though, was that having done this, having conquered the enemy that the Roman armies themselves had been unable to conquer fully at this point, Odenathus and his wife, Queen Zenobia, essentially took the area for themselves. Odenathus is quickly assassinated, and in the real powerhouse behind all of this is Queen Zenobia. And Zenobia essentially takes a third of the Roman Empire for herself. And this today is known as the Palmyrene Empire. Essentially, again, the a third of the empire out east had defected. And similar things happened in the west. In the west, you have the ongoing pressure by the Germanic barbarian tribes, the Franks and the Goths and the Vandals, and all these groups that are pushing into the Western Roman world. And eventually, again, the Roman Empire and the Roman armies are unable to put a stop to this pressure and to these raiding tribes that are pushing deeper and deeper into the Western world. And so, as a result, out west you have another defection. In 260, Posthumus, a general in the Roman army of the west, defected and created for himself a region that we today call the Gaelic Roman Empire. And so, by 260, as a result of a number of the convulsions and the fighting and the Roman civil wars, what you end up having is a divided empire for the very first time, again, since the beginning, since the 
indomitable conquering spirit of the Roman Empire, you now have dissension. You have essentially three sub-empires, three pieces of the empire that are broken up. And so as the armies attempt to reassert the dominance of Rome, you find that the soldier emperors, as they're sometimes called, these non-aristocratic rulers who take the empire by force and attempt to reassert the dominance of Rome, that these emperors tend also to dramatically reassert the faithfulness and the cultic worship of the old pagan world. A lot of this is difficult to get our arms around fully. It seems that the armies in particular were places of real serious devotion to the gods. And so there is some argument to be had that the emperors, whenever they were soldiers, brought with it a martial ethos of devotion to the gods, that these emperors wanted a certain stability of Roman culture. And the way that they sought that was very often through enforced regulation of civic worship. And so you see during this exact same time, during the Roman civil wars and during the martial ethos period of the third century crisis, a number of global persecutions of the Christian faith that did not exist before. Now, of course, there had been persecutions in the earlier centuries of the church. We can't read the book of Acts or the book of Revelation, and we can't read the early church fathers without becoming painfully aware of the extent to which there were small pockets of serious persecution of the Christians. And at times, particularly under Nero and Domitian, there was an attempt to institute something like a global persecution of Christians. But it's not until the third century that you start to see serious persecutions on a global scale undertaken with the severity that we see in the third century. Two in particular should be noted. In 250 and 251, there was what we today call the Decian persecution, that is, the persecution enacted by Trajan Decius. And Decius had a number of reasons for this, the most famous of which was the Cyprian Plague. This plague gets its name from St. Cyprian, who would be martyred under Decius. And the Cyprian Plague was, we think, the smallpox or something like this. It was a pandemic that swept through the Western Roman world. And it seems as if Decius, among others, were concerned by this. Of course, in Roman pagan religion, it's not simply the fervent belief of the few that win the appeasement of the gods. But as we see throughout Greco-Roman mythology, even a few who abstain in a culture, those who might be attending, say, a public event and there's a sacrifice to the gods, well, if not everyone participates, even a small few... Then, according to the old pagan ways of religion, the gods could become angry because not everyone has at least given some mental assent to the pagan sacrifice to them. Whatever the case, Trajan Decius enacted one of the most severe persecutions that we have in early church history. Decius required that all peoples throughout Rome go to the city center where they lived and offer a libation to the gods. Usually this meant pouring out some form of incense, maybe it was a pinch of incense, maybe it was pouring out some kind of perfume, and then often the person would have to taste from the sacrifices as well. And for those who did the sacrifice, for those who did their civic duty, you would be given a libellus. And a libellus is essentially a little piece of paper that's, that declares that I have sacrifice to the gods that I've participated, that I've done my civic duty, and that because of this, I can now produce this libellus and show any of the governing elites of small cities and villages and throughout the Roman Empire that I am on the team. And of course, Christians are unwilling to do this. Very often they would abstain or they would not show up when it was required. And in the Decian persecutions, the punishment for not attending and participating in the sacrifices to the gods was considered to be a capital crime. 
And we know it was therefore pretty easy to f- discover who were Christians in the area, those who would not have a labellus on them or those who would refuse to attend could be easily marked out and brought in and put on trial. This is certainly what happens with Cyprian, as we saw at the beginning of this lecture. Numerous Christians that suffer under torture, or they are asked to hand over the Gospels. This is particularly a crime for priests. In the early church, when they would say that a priest was entrusted with the Gospel or the Gospels, this usually had a double meaning. The priest would be entrusted with the teachings of the gospel. They would be empowered and equipped to be the priests of the community, and therefore they would be those who taught the word of God. But often, in many cases, it meant also a double meaning that they would be handed the gospels themselves. Remember that texts and books and handwritten manuscripts at this time were relatively expensive things. They were not easy to come by, and they had to be handwritten. And so those who became priests were entrusted with the scriptures, physically as well as theologically. And under the Decian persecution, what you see is a new title of traitor comes up. Literally, a traitore is someone who hands over, and in this case, it's a priest who hands over the Gospels to be burned by the Roman pagan rulers. And so the Decian persecutions were among the worst. It's in 250, just as the Decian persecutions are underway, that the Pope himself, Pope Fabian, is beheaded in Rome for being immoral and not sacrificing to the gods. Still, the persecution only lasted for 13 months. The Christians gloried in the fact that Decius, the man who was so violently attacking the Christian church, died himself at the hands of the Goths. He had gone out east to push back a Gothic tribe that had come down into modern-day Turkey, and he lost. And as a result, Trajan himself died on the battlefield, and the successor to Trajan, Decius, issued an edict of toleration calling for the end to the persecution of Christians, at least for the time being. The next emperor that comes on the scene that causes problems for the Christians is the Emperor Valerian. Now, as we've shown, the problem with the empire at this time is that the toughs that are running the military, in particular the higher-up military figures, often believe that they are better equipped and better prepared to reestablish Roman dominance. And the aristocracy is starting to lose favor amongst the Roman military. Valerian, though, presents at least one great hope for the army, Valerian actually comes from the traditional senatorial classes. His family was aristocratic, and therefore Valerian himself could hope to bridge the gap between the armies and the aristocracy. And after the Decian execution, there was yet another rebellion. The army out east had put its own man forward as the replacement for the empire, and it was to the surprise of many, that Valerian decided to go out and attempt to suppress the rebellion either through talks or through military action. And as Valerian gets close to the rebelling armies as it's marching towards Rome, the army does something quite astonishing. They kill their leader, and then they proclaim Valerian to be the new emperor. And the Senate quickly ratifies this, and it It is often said that they did this because they were cowardly, and there is certainly an element of that. But actually, if you look at it, Valerian being one of the senatorial classes, one of the the aristocracy, and now being proclaimed as an emperor, they believed, as well as the army believed, that he offered the best hope for the way forward to get them out of the crisis. And Valerian, like most great emperors, attempted to wage war as a way to establish his dominance. He marched out east and attempted to reestablish Roman territory in the lands that were quickly falling to the Sassanidid Empire. And the ruler of the Sassanidid Empire at this time was Shapur I. And Shapur was actually quite a shrewd and an expert battleman. One of the things that he does is he takes the city in the region of Antioch, which is a prized possession for Rome, having come over to them when they had conquered the Greeks. 
And so Valerian believes that he needs to go out and put an end to this rebellion uh, and take back the lands that were now lost to Shapur. And it goes well at first. Uh, Valerian doesn't lose a lot of battles in his early days. He actually does manage to take Antioch back. And along the way, he also manages to beat back the Goths who were working their way down into those areas and those regions as they were coming down and sweeping in and making their presence known. He beats them back as well. However, in 260, at the Battle of Edessa, Shapur gets the upper hand and Valerian's armies lose decisively. And Valerian is forced to endure perhaps the biggest embarrassment of a Roman emperor ever. Shapur captures Valerian. He keeps Valerian in captivity permanently. He doesn't ship him back. He doesn't attempt to ransom him and he doesn't execute him. And at least one account tells us that Valerian served for the rest of his days as Shapur's footstool. That anytime Valerian wanted to get on his horse, Valerian would kneel down and Shapur would use the back of Valerian to sort of hoist himself up onto his horse. So much for the blending of the aristocracy and the, the military toughs who were attempting to rule the empire. But like Decius, Valerian was a significant persecutor of Christianity. He attempted to issue another global persecution of Christians. In 257, Valerian sends a letter back to Rome in which he calls on the Senate to ratify that Christians were no longer to be allowed to own property, that they could no longer serve as high-ranking aristocracy, and that they could not serve in the royal court. And in 257, he calls for their banishment, which is actually a bit of a lesser punishment. It was certainly better than death in the normal Roman way. Just a year later, though, Valerian issues an order that Christians are to be executed, that banishment was not enough, and that any who are found to be Christians, particularly in the royal household, are to be sent off as slaves to the territorial estates. And this evidence of Valerian, where he, he cites the, the cases that Christians hold property, that they are of certain high rank amongst the Roman peoples, and that they serve in the noble houses, is often used as evidence that Christians were on the rise in society, that they were no longer simply the poor and the outcasts, that they were beginning to make inroads, and they were beginning to find sympathetic ears all the way through the levels of society. Now, the evidence is a bit hard to measure. It's, it, Valerian doesn't give us any numbers. And as we know throughout history, sometimes it's the presence of maybe only a few or isolated cases that cause emperors and kings and queens to issue edicts banning all of them across the country. And historians on not a few occasions have gotten in trouble by overplaying this bit of evidence. The simple answer is we don't know what the, uh, this means. It, does this mean that Christianity is rapidly rising in society, or does it mean that there are a few isolated, worrisome cases to Valerian, and he wants to stamp out any Christian presence, no matter how small, for the sake of appeasing the gods? The simple answer is we don't know. In the end, though, the first two great global persecutions during this empire are really one of the cataclysmic events for the church. A number of Christians caved under the threat of torture, or for the sake of losing their lives entirely, or perhaps because some of them were lukewarm and they were not truly Christians and they were doing so for other reasons entirely. Still, what happens is, is the two great emperors who issue global persecutions of the church end up meeting two of the worst fates any Roman emperor had ever faced. One is killed really as a sign of the increased weakness of the Roman army to beat back the armies on the east, their enemies. And another, even worse, is made a perpetual footstool to a pagan Persian emperor. And Christians were not slow to point out the fact that if you persecute God's people, God will simply humble you, that he will bring you down and make you lower in the eyes of your own people. Still, the impact on the church of the persecution era of the third century is significant. The persecutions were worse than they had occurred in the early centuries of the church, under, particularly under Nero and Domitian. These persecutions were global, they were purposeful, 
They were attempting to weed out any Christian whatsoever, not just simply the Christians who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Within the church, though, besides the fact that they could gloat a little bit at the destruction of the tyrants who were persecuting them, the church went through a number of changes and a number of convulsions as a result of the persecutions. Perhaps the greatest issue would be how do you deal with those who had lapsed, with those who had given up the faith vocally or even handed over the Gospels? Do they need to be rebaptized? Have they lost their faith forever? If they're a clergyman, if they're a priest, can they be restored to the priesthood or are they now subject to being simply a layman for the rest of their lives? Have they given up their ordination vows because they gave up their call to follow Christ even unto death. Now, a number of these issues are really only on the horizon. They're sort of percolating below the surface, but they will quickly come to a head with the rise of the Donatist party. And the Donatists are those who eventually take a hardline stance against those who have caved under these pressures. And they call for rebaptism for all who have given up the faith. And those who are not Donatists, those who oppose them, of course, had to deal with the fact that people had significantly caved in and had denied their Lord under death, and how could that square with the gospel? And the answer they often gave was they pointed to the apostle Peter, that Peter, under pain of death, had caved and denied his Lord three times, at the cross, no less. Peter had found forgiveness in Christ, and Peter had been restored, and he had still been one of the apostles and one of the leaders of the early church. And the non-Donatists, of course, said, how could we follow the apostles and the apostolic teaching and not own up to the fact that we are sinners, and even sinners who deny the faith need to be restored? And the conclusion to the story of the Donatists will finish up in our lecture under Constantine. Constantine will eventually rule against the Donatists. But we need to realize that these early persecutions, the Decian persecution and the Valerian persecution, were significantly important for the church. In the end, the 3rd century crisis was a watershed moment for the Roman Empire. There was hyperinflation, there were boundary wars as the Persians and then the Franks and the Goths uh, and the Vandals up to the north began to encroach on Roman territories. There were internal divisions. The Roman Empire broke up into three separate pieces for a period of time. Emperor after emperor is slain, and then another one is appointed by the army. And there is so much confusion and so much that is lost about the Roman identity that had been so much a part of its identity for so long that eventually someone must take drastic measures. And the man who does this is Diocletian, and we will look at Diocletian in our next lecture.